We got Mr. Kevin O'Connor joining us this week. I like his email handle, how it reads, or what is it called? Your signature? Oh, your I don't email? know. It says K-O-C, K-O apostrophe C. That is pretty cool. Yeah, I could do something I think like you that. need an apostrophe to have that. You could just add one. <laughs> T, T apostrophe R-G. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so confusing. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so we had... Uh, but I, I didn't realize it's crazy how how fast time flies, but it was four and a half years ago since we drove up in his words, ambushed him <laughs> and recorded a podcast in above his garage, uh, which is ludicrous to think that we ambushed yeah. him. It, it's it's a six hour drive for me. There's zero ambushing. <laughs> He's like, I thought you came, I thought you just came up to me. You know, and have dinner. It's like no. you cooked us pasta. Yeah, there was you there know? was no ambush. Yeah, a, a good pasta. Dinner. But we, I mean, we definitely kind of rehashed the craftsmanship and, um, you know, uh, technology and, and, and things like that. But we spend a good amount of time understanding, you know, the the nuances in media, uh, but also learn learning about his new show. Um. Yeah, and the, the acquisition of this old house by Roku, yes, um, which is interesting. And if you guys are not aware, you can watch the entire This Old House library. 40 You years. can stream it. Yeah. I think that they're on, like, I was looking on their website today. I don't know if they're currently showing 45. I think 44 may be what is currently published, but they have recorded 45 seasons and they said uh, each season is a year which is crazy to think that's a very long time that they've been around yeah so they were acquired by roku and roku basically told them hey we want to increase the amount of video content you guys are doing they increased this old house as well as ask but then they launched a, a brand new show that is focused on this amazing volunteer group that is helping people that i mean face natural disaster you know responding to hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding um and, and kev gives us a a can i call him kev koc koc i'm gonna call him kev kev gives <laughs> us the uh the background as to what that story is um what their involvement is uh, and then, of course, we dig into the trades and the current state of, you know, our industry, how things have changed over four and a half years, how his mindset has changed uh, and, and what he think what he thinks we've done right and what he thinks we've done wrong um, and how we can counteract some of that. It was a good conversation. He's obviously a, a very well-versed, intelligent, well-spoken individual um so no knock at any other guests or ourselves but he definitely cleans up the podcast and makes it sound very professional this podcast is brought to you by anderson windows are your clients asking for indoor outdoor living in their homes anderson has a broad portfolio of products that can help you deliver on this piece of luxury living that everyone is asking for Everyone thinks about big doors first, and they have plenty of those. In fact, their lift slide door can be as large as 16 feet tall and 60 feet wide. But they also have lots of options to bring indoor slash outdoor living to a home with a smaller footprint. The A-series patio door can go up to 10 foot tall panel, and with a four panel configuration, you can reach 16 feet wide. And for spaces where a door isn't an option, but you still want to open the wall, they have a pass-through window that can fold out or even pocket. Check out the indoor-outdoor living solutions at andersonwindows.com. This podcast is also brought to you by BuilderTrend. Ask builders and remodelers what's the most important aspect of a project, and you'll likely get the same answer, the schedule. Before starting a job, the timeline needs to be created to see how long it will take and how much it's going to cost. Using construction scheduling software like BuilderTrend is the best way to do this. Creating a schedule in BuilderTrend is simple and efficient. Plus, it's repeatable. When you use templates, you won't have to build a schedule from scratch for every job. Why else use the scheduling tool in BuilderTrend? It keeps projects on track, improves team collaboration, and helps you complete more jobs, which leads to more profit. 
to see build a trend scheduling feature in action and learn how it can help you better maintain project timelines, go to buildertrend.com forward slash MC demo. When you, when you work for a bank, they take your fingerprints. There's no way around it. Mm. I had to get fingerprinted to work at a bank. How long? Okay. I, I forgot about that. You worked at a bank for a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. I used to be a banker. FBI has got my fingerprints in case I decided to launder some money. Uh-oh. <laughs> you probably wouldn't be the first person. Oh, definitely not. We, we would spend months on money laundering training. And you'd be like, why are we spending? And then you realize why we're spending so much money, like, what, so much time on money laundering training. Because you're like, yeah. oh, this must be a really big problem. Yeah, right. So, and- so, so the last time we spoke... Well, maybe not the last time that we spoke. That was, we had you on the podcast episode 40, which was the end of October, 2018. So four and a half years ago. That's crazy. Has it been that long? Yeah. Well, but, but you've had other TA waiters along the way since then, right? But it's not the same. It's not the same as you. You know? <laughs> You're right. It's not. Norm, Norm is definitely not the same as me. <laughs> I or Tommy. Yeah, I can't believe it's been that long ago where we, we came up to your house um, and recorded in person. And then we had that that Kukin Brothers um, event. A lot has happened with the construction industry, social media. Um, what's been going on with you? Well, big picture status quo. You know, still at this old house and ask this old house. I think I just started my 20th season, maybe my 21st. I've lost Holy track. Shit. No. Yeah, I know. 20. And our seasons are a year. So, yeah, it's 20 years plus doing those two shows. Um, they're going strong. Everyone's still there except for Norm, who's officially retired. He was phasing out, but um, he is Did, officially retired. That was last year, right? He retired. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which was awesome because. We, we got to go to L.A. for some Emmy ceremonies and stuff like that. And Norm and his wife came out with us and it was a group celebration, but it was really a it was really a send off for Norm. It was yeah. very, very nice to be able to do that for him. So what, what, what's he what's he gone off to do? Hang out on well, a boat or he built a new house. Um, it's done. He still has to build the workshop. So he's doing that. Typical Norm mm. uh, wants to do a lot of it himself. And he proclaims that as soon as it's done, his first project is to build a boat because the house is down on the water near Rhode Island. And uh, nice. I mean, he's still around. He's just not on TV. I mean, he was with us a couple of weeks ago. We finished a sure. we finished a local project and he came up to the wrap and hung out afterwards for the party and stuff like that. So yeah, I think he's just enjoying. I mean, you say, wow, I was 20 years. He was 40 plus on both yeah. house and New Yankee workshops. So he had it coming. He had, he had retirement coming. Mm. Yeah. As far, I mean, as far as the show, like this old house and ask, I mean, you guys, you guys moved to Roku, right? Roku bought the property, I think, two years ago now. Um, okay. Correct. So they got the library, the production company, and uh, which has been great because they let us, not only did they let us ask us to continue making the show, but they let us keep it on PBS as first run. So it's just oh, cool. kind of seamless for the audience. But we get the added benefit of you know free streaming on the Roku platform too, which is huge. Did that change production or like how much you're producing? No. Um, initially, out of the gate, they asked for 50% more episodes in the very first year. So we did okay. that and added a project. We have pulled back from that, and their focus has been new shows. Got it. So instead of making more of the two, they've asked us to come up with ideas for new shows, which is where the Team Rubicon show idea came from, and there were others in the works, and to expand our um, horizons a little bit. New talent, Makers Network, various other people in various other streaming channels and cross you know, collaboration, cross pollination type stuff. So I mean, were they be, were they able to publish the whole library or the majority of the library on Roku? Oh right. yeah, that's I sweet. Mean, it's, it's streaming, right? So it's limitless. Um, so th- there's a couple of different ways that they put it out there. You know, there's a linear channel, there's an on-demand channel. That, you know, you can subscribe as an insider and pull up the entire library going back forever, or you could wait for Roku to drop this season or that season on the streaming mm-hmm. or the linear. So um, it's staggering how much video content is out there after 44 years of TV. Sure. So. And I, and I mean, it's staggering just thinking about one, like one show, like this old house, but how much video content there is just being produced and, you know, categorized into a library just in general. 
Yeah. It's it, it, yeah. like you said, it's, it, there's a, it's limitless when it comes to the streaming side of it. It, it is limitless. I don't know the stats, but I've heard them in the past. You know, the amount sure. of video getting dropped to, you know, the, the web yeah. every day, every hour. It's just staggering. So it's wild. I want to talk about Team Rucom, but before we do, as far as, you know, this old house, ask this old house, is there, is there any consideration to change what you guys have done? Or is that going to stay on the path that it's been and, and really just continue to, to thrive in the space that it's always been? I think the short answer is no plans to change it. Uh, I think the nuanced answer is it's changing all of the time. If sure. you were to pop on an episode from last season and throw it up next to an episode from season, say, 30, mm -hmm. and then up against season 15, you'd see some pretty dramatic differences. Sure. Um, I think most of that's sort of filming and cinematography type stuff. Content-wise, yeah. it's been very clear um, from Roku management and our current you know, management producers with this old house, just keep doing what you're doing. And cool. it's going to sound like a humble brag, but we're still the most watched home improvement show on TV by a factor of like 10. You know, there's other wow. stuff that comes and goes and they get buzzed for sure. And people you know, run over to see them, but you take any of the other ones on any of those stations and it just doesn't even come close. So the philosophy is you got a formula, you got a very trusted crew and cast, let them do what they do best and let them stay at it. Why do you th why do you think that stat exists? Like, why do you think you guys are ten x more watched than anything else? I think there's three reasons. Um, the blocking and tackling is in our favor. You know, you distribute it on PBS. It's in 120 plus million households. You're on DIY or HGTV. It's cable, so the pool is smaller. Um, mm -hmm. So you spread it out into a bigger pool. You're going to get more eyeballs. Uh, on top of which, you get the PBS distribution, and then you get the Roku distribution. So it's out there. The legacy has got to be part of it. You know, people who have been watching it forever, that's momentum. They keep watching it or it becomes part of the routine or they, you know, end up growing up watching it next to their father or something like that. And then all of a sudden they get a house and they know where to turn. So that's part of it. And then the trust, obviously the trust mark, people trust it. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of, I think, of all of those things. Yeah, no, that's fair. So, so Team Rubicon, you announced, I think, yesterday. Um, yeah. Well, I guess when people are listening to this, this would be a, a week past. Not but yesterday. Not yesterday. <laughs> uh, but what's going on with Rubicon? So as I said, Roku asked us to make more, um, come up with ideas. And internally, our crew threw out this idea of profiling this phenomenal um, organization, volunteer organization called Team Rubicon. It's a veteran created org organization um, that basically rushes in after natural disasters and helps clean up, rebuild. Um, it is mostly vets, you know, 60 to 70 percent veterans, um, but also civilians as well. Um, it's 160,000 volunteers strong. So it's wow. a pretty big national organization. Um, the, the favorite way I've heard it described is that it's a it's a standing volunteer fire department. You know, people mm. who become members of Team Rubicon are called gray shirts. They all wear, we all wear gray shirts. We go through training. Uh, we learn how to do certain skill sets, you know, how to clean uh, muck, use chainsaws, take trees down, tarp roofs, site survey, all these types of things. People are trained. And then these volunteers are all over the country. If a natural disaster happens, they get deployed. Um, email goes out and says, who can help? There's been a hurricane down in Florida. Ian wiped out, you know, thousands of homes. Who can go down there and help out? And you know, overnight, hundreds of volunteers are deployed to go in. And we, as a production company, This Old House and Ask This Old House, had worked with Team Rubicon years ago um, on a couple different occasions, but most significantly after Hurricane Harvey dropped 50 inches of rain on Houston. Um, in a day or so and caused massive flooding. And when we went down there to do some work, we bumped into them and kind of fell in love with the organization. Like when you see what's going on, a bunch mm -hmm. of people who are just real kick ass, get stuff done kind of people mm -hmm. um, and are just spending their vacation time, their weekends, uh, taking time off from work to go help complete strangers. It's a pretty compelling story. And so Michael Burton, one of the guys on our team, you know, pitched it as an idea and people said, let's do it. And so we just finished a 13 part series where we follow Team Rubicon for five months in bed with them, volunteer with them and show what they do. So you said you're you said, the you're the host of this show. I'm the host of the show. Um, I, I became a gray shirt. I went through all the training for Team Rubicon and I embedded with them. And so the camera follows me around. It's not traditional hosting as you think of, you know, my yeah. role in the house asking people questions. It's 
a lot of focus on the volunteers and the survivors, the homeowners who've been affected. I happen to be the motivating factor of, all right, Kevin, go to Florida, respond to Hurricane um, Ian, go to uh, Mississippi to respond to the tornadoes, go to the West Coast to respond to the atmospheric rivers that are flooding the place. But it's not mm, so much about me. It's a lot about the Rubicon folks who are out there volunteering. And then the, the homeowners, you know, who are phenomenal people who just had a really, really bad day um, who are getting served by the whole thing. Are you, are they doc or did they document your training? Yes. That's cool. I kind of want to see that. <laughs> I want it to be like military training now. Uh, Scrape the muck. Scrape the muck. <laughs> it's not, it's not that hardcore, but it is serious. Like it yeah. is, they, you know, they don't mess around. Like they don't want, they have a saying that they do, they do dangerous stuff safely. Um, so, well, you know, they'll put dangerous. people up onto a roof with yeah. a chainsaw and say, take large trees down, but they're not right. going to do it until they're properly trained, they got certifications, they've got the right equipment. Um, there's a lot of sort of making sure they do it well and do it right. And they're very fastidious about that. And most importantly, they train you on the culture. There's a whole culture to this thing and it's awesome. And they just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So, so they started in 2010, I think I read, and you said they're up to 160,000 volunteers now. Who who started that? I know there were some veterans involved and, and why did they start that? Do you know, do you know that? Yeah, sure. I mean, and if you do any sort of research on Rubicon, this is a story that comes up. Jake Wood, who was a Marine sniper, um, him and a couple of other people responded to an earthquake in Haiti, a, a very, very bad one uh, over a dozen years ago, 150, 180,000 people died, devastation across the board. And, I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm not the best person to tell the team Rubicon story, so forgive me. But basically, Jake and his compatriots, you know, saw what was happening down there, knew that they were highly trained individuals. They were no longer in the military, but they had all these skills. And they said, we should be there. We can help. They ended up trekking across the mountains to get into the country because it was, there was no way to get there. Set up a very small team, um, a couple other Marines. They met up with a Jesuit priest, a couple doctors, and they began doing triage work, medical work. Um, and that was the genesis, you know, for the idea. And what Jake and his, again, his, his compatriots decided was that there was something here and that they had a lot of veterans out there who were no longer serving their country, but were highly trained, highly motivated and looking for ways to continue to serve. And so Team Rubicon was born of that idea that these people can go into the community and help the fellow citizens. And so that's the genesis for it. Is their idea to be primarily domestic within the United States. I know that they are going outside of that, but are they, like is the idea for them generally to be serving our own country? I think so. I mean, that's primarily where the operations are. They do yeah. go overseas. Um, their, their missions overseas, as I understand it, um, tend to be more medical related. They're highly trained medical professionals who can go in into very risky situations. Again, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this. There are folks from you know the organization that can tell you better. But for example, you know they were over in Ukraine. In order to go over there and not become part of the problem or become people who need assistance um, in any way, the people who end up going are both highly trained in medical um, techniques, but also they're able to survive on their own. They're able to get their own food and water clean, um, make sure that they are completely self-sufficient. And if you think about that. To be out in a foreign country, literally out amongst, you know, whatever, for three or four weeks on your own with no supplies or anything like that. You got to be pretty badass and competent. So I think the international ones is a higher level, sort of different scope. But the primary focus is on the domestic. And for better or for worse, there's no shortage of domestic yeah. storms, natural disasters and people who need help on a regular basis. When you say that, thinking about natural disasters, obviously, like, you know, my, my ignorance is what I'm you know, fed by the news or what's, you know, it, what's the latest issue or, or natural disaster. But for an organization like this, 160,000 people that get deployed all over the country, is this, you know, I guess in short, is this something that is, they're constantly bouncing around? Oh, you yeah. Know, like they're, they're, there's always something for them to be handled. They, correct. There's always something. They have two parts of the year, they call it blue skies versus gray skies. Mm -hmm. You know, the blue skies are the slower natural event part of the season. Got it. 
Um, we're just coming out of that. Um, and then the gray skies is when activity starts. Hurricanes are the primary driver of a lot sure. of what they respond to and such. And those start to kick up in the summer as the warm water hits the coast down in there, those types of things. And but, frankly, that could take months to clean up anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they're, you know, we did an deployment to um, Puerto Rico. That's two years after, you know, the first hurricane that they're responding to. So they're still there doing rebuild efforts and stuff like that. Months, they, they rebuild too. They're actually rebuilding houses in some of these areas. That's what they were doing in Houston. Mm -hmm. so those things can take years. But to give you a, a, a sense, um, you, you know, most people don't think of it as a natural disaster, but the heavy rains that hit California, even the snowpack. Yeah. Um, 700 inches of snow over a short period of time, people were stranded in their houses and team Rubicon volunteers, um, simply drove up there and got shovels and got people out of their houses. People who were not able to get out of their houses for two weeks. Um, so small operations like that are going on all of the time. A levee broke in California, um, in a dry, arid place. And then it was flooded. That was going on. And that's not necessarily a big natural disaster, but locally, if that's where you live, it's a disaster. So they are monitoring the weather in these situations. Um, all day year round and responding accordingly throughout the year. And, so, and how are these people paid? Like, you know, no, none of them. We're not, none of, none of the volunteers are paid. Obviously there's a, there's a core group of team Rubicon, I guess I'll call them administration sure. who are full-time employees, but the vast majority of the people um, who are deployed for a week, two, three weeks at a time are unpaid. So imagine someone who's a, what we call an incident commander, He's running a 200 person operation down um, in Fort Myer, Florida, responding to Ian. And he might be there for two or three weeks, sleeping on a cot, working from, you know, 5 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night. Volunteer, 100 percent volunteer. But the, the, and I guess that's what I was going to get at is they're on the short stint. So when you talk about being in Puerto Rico for two years, you don't have 50 people there that have been there for two years. It's this rotation of volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important that they rotate. They keep you out there in the field for typically three, three days to a week, send you back home so that you can, can refresh. Got it. Uh, they are volunteers. So people have lives. Uh, the organization is big enough and fluid enough that they bring a wave in for a week, send a wave home, bring another wave in. Maybe some of the, they call it command and general staff. There's the military thing, Tyler. They use sort of all that, that um, language. They, they may hang around for a two week period, but they'll get changed out as well. But everyone is trained in the same language. Sure. Everyone is trained in the same job. Um, everyone knows exactly how to plug into any situation because the training is such that you can show up not having done it for six months into a place that you've never been to before. And if they give you a job that you've been trained in, it's exactly the same as what you did six, six months prior. The toolkits, all the tools are identical. I know exactly what's in a um, first aid pack. I know what's in a Sawyer's kit. I, I know how many axes there are. I know where the scrunch is. I know how many helmets there are, everything. So you can plug a volunteer in anywhere at any time. And because of this amazing training, they're ready to hit the, the ground going day one. So their network of volunteers, similar to Red Cross, where they have a pool of volunteers that are affiliated with this organization that they're dipping into, probably based on location and availability when a natural disaster occurs. I think so. I'm not actually intimately familiar with Red Cross, but that's the way it feels. So I think that's right, Tyler. Yeah. Um, so they've had, from my understanding, they had had, whether it be shows or organizations, approach them prior to you guys that wanted to document what they were doing. Why do you feel that they allowed your team and your production to follow them around and make a TV show about them? Like, what did you guys bring to the table for their organization that they said yes to you and had turned down previous opportunities? I think it's our reputation. And I think it's the trust, you know, Mark, that we provide in the other world that we're in. You know, I think people still trust Tommy and Richard and Jen and Mark and those guys more than anyone else out there in terms of contractors in the field, you know, and the TV show has always been sort of very honest and true to that, making sure that, you know, we're using professional craftspeople to tell our story, except for me, professional host, I guess, but you know, whatever you guys get it right. The thing that this whole house does very well, which is keep it real and keep it, you know, very trustworthy. Um, they were familiar with the organization. We met with them. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a yes right out of the gate. Yeah. Ella Cruz is the CEO and we were out in California and had a lunch with them and you know talked to him and pitched it and all that kind of stuff. So it was a little bit of a dance. But short answer, I think, you know, they trusted us more than anyone else who had come to them. I don't know who else came to them, 
but I think they trusted us more than anyone else who came to them and said, yeah, these guys put out good work. They're probably the right people to do it. And they were, most of them were familiar with this old house. A lot. Yeah. yeah. I feel yeah. like that I mean, had to play a part in it. Yeah, I do. I, a lot of people are familiar with this old house, even if they're not, you know, diehard fans. Um, when you are, you know, more men are familiar with it. I think more military is probably familiar with it. First responders, they, they all sort of seem to be of that ilk. So I think people generally know us. I think that slice of the world probably knows us a little better than other slices. So um, your role in this show was a lot different than your host role in this old house. And you, you, somewhat mentioned that earlier in this conversation um was there a learning curve to how to host the show in this manner versus what you've done over the course of however many years yeah for sure i mean i'm very lucky on this old house and ask this old house that i just sort of get to ask the questions of guys and gals who i know have the answer um and it's transfer of information basically you know charlie how are we doing this you know why, why are we doing this steel beam and how does it get done? And Charlie carries the burden right there. You know, with Rubicon, it's the story of how to respond to these natural disasters. But a lot of it's mostly the personal stories. Mm. You know, what what is the veteran doing there? Why? What have their what's their journey been? So there's been there was a lot of sort of having to wrap your shoulder, you know, wrap your arm around someone's shoulder and sort of get it out of them. And also to do it, you had to kind of be it. So, you know, I had to be a gray shirt and I had to work with them side by side. It was exhausting. It was brutal. I mean, it was weeks at a time, nine deployments over four months, not seeing your family or whatever, but you had to earn their trust because they were there to volunteer, which was important to them. And you showed up with a camera and they're kind of like, I think anyone's a little suspicious of anyone who shows up with a camera. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if you guys get that. Oh yeah. So a lot of it was just living the TR code and showing them that we were serious. Um, If and when people watch it, you'll, you won't see a lot of me. You'll see I voice over a lot of stuff and I'm clearly there, but it's a lot about the volunteers and the homeowners who, who get helped. It's a lot about them. And so the process for me was making that possible with a tremendous crew, extracting those stories and that emotion. I, uh, I joke in a sort of a debrief that I did that, you know, a couple of them turned me into a hugger because, you know, I don't, I don't hug people. No, no one, no one, on, oh, there's my dog. Um, no one on the house hugs anybody. We're hugging everybody. It, 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 when somebody loses everything they have and walks back to their house, which you're either about to take down or have just emptied out and thrown all of their life possessions on the curb, it is an emotional day. It is an emotional week. When somebody is, you know, living, squatting in a house that's unlivable, thinking that someone was going to show up from FEMA and it's now five weeks after the disaster and nobody has shown up and you're part of the team who's the first group to show up, it's an emotional day. Mm. So there's a lot of emotion like that um, from folks. I mean, that was one of the questions that I had for you, essentially, when all of this happens, right? There's a natural disaster, there's people in need, people in distress, and then Kevin O'Connor shows up with a film crew. And it's like, okay, are they here to help? Is this commercializing? I mean, this is what every single news network ever does. But being able to walk that line and gain that trust from those people has to be so difficult in these situations. It is definitely hard. Um, Like, I would be like, what the fuck is Kevin O'Connor doing here? Like, seriously. (laughs) Happens all the time. (laughs) Um, it definitely, yes, that definitely happened. Uh, when you tell them you're from this old house, half of them stand down and are like, oh, okay. Um, and then after that, it's, you know, when you, when you sleep on the cot next to them at the VFW hall, mm. um, and you get up with them, uh, and you go without a shower for a couple of days or you, you know, there's one working faucet in the bathroom and you wash down with a towel uh, because you're stinking. Uh, and if you go out and you work with them and you do it faithfully and honestly, they, they, they let you in eventually. Um, nobody threw any shade at us from the beginning, but you did see a couple, you know, emotional and physical walls come down after a couple of days of working with them where they're just like, Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. These guys are willing to put in the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you have any trouble 
kind of compartmentalizing this being that it's so much different that like you said before this old house it's it's very black and white there's not a ton of gray area you're transferring information from one person to another but with this obviously there's there's emotional stressors there's trauma you're in these people's lives and you're away from your family and everything else were you able to compartmentalize what you're experiencing and separate those emotions from work and everything else? It's interesting that you asked that because the answer is I had to and I struggled with it. Um, and I can remember one of the final deployments that I did. So now it's at the end of the making of the show. We're all pretty run down. We tried to fit it in in the quiet moment of this old house and ask. That quiet moment disappears and those shows are ramping back up. So my final deployment, I was supposed to be going to um, Puerto Rico either on a Sunday night or a Monday morning. Um, my parents hadn't seen my oldest uh, who had gone abroad to study for, uh, you know, Thanksgiving or for a couple of months. So they came up to the house. They just arrived uh, and then a tornado hit Mississippi and the call came in, you're going right away. Um, <laughs> so I packed the bag a couple hours later, we're on our way to Mississippi. My wife's like, how long are your parents staying? <laughs> I was gonna say they, they go with list you? the questions behind that. <laughs> right. So off I go and you know, they stay, we go. Um and you know, from Mississippi, something else happens in California. We pack up, we head to California to hit that. I've got a pre existing TV appearance, guest TV appearance on the schedule in Kansas City on a Friday, Saturday night. I've got a pull out of, you know, I can't get out of it. You know, I promise this guy that they, they, I'm a celebrity judge or some BS like that, you know, whatever. I can't get out of it. So I go to that. I show up in the afternoon and it's a cocktail party before. And I'm talking to corporate people and they're giving me pitches on their company's HR mission. And I'm just in a fog. I'm like, what the F are you talking about? You know, yeah. For five days and two hours before, we're helping people who've lost their entire lives. And now I'm eating fancy hors d'oeuvres, handed drinks in a fancy downtown Kansas City. A very nice event, and everything about it was great, but it was so jarring mm. that I just was, it was crazy. And then the next day I do the hosting for that television thing, and I'm like, I gotta get out of here. Like, I gotta get back to this thing that's going on because people's lives are still in a shambles and your crew's still back there waiting for you. It totally messed me up. I hadn't been that messed up in a long time. Just in like emotion, I was just like, what the hell am I doing? I was completely overwhelmed with it. Um, and it was a good lesson. You know, it was a really good lesson because you're thinking about what's the what's the hardship for Kevin O'Connor? The cocktails were too nice and the hors d'oeuvres were too fancy. Uh, and I'm leaving people who have been flooded out of their homes and lost everything. And you just kind of, you get a lot of perspective very quickly. Well, yeah, you're, you're there, you're there to do your job and be a professional and execute, but at the same time, you're a human being and you have emotions and emotional ties to these people. So it's like, where's the delineation there between the two? And how do you walk away from that and be like, well, that's just my job. Right. It, it, uh, absolutely. They, they blur that it blurred more than it ever had before. So yeah. yeah Does that good. like in that moment, thinking about, you know, what you have done your whole career, you know, and, and especially related to hosting uh, a show that you're delivering information. But in this moment, when it is so jarring, does it make you change your outlook or change your consideration as to what you want to focus on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in a little way, right? I mean, you still, it, it's not like the one job is bad and the other job is good or whatever, but sure. you you do very, I mean, you guys know this, the, the sort of longer you're at it and the busier you get, you got to prioritize stuff all the time. And it's, it's yeah. almost less about what you say yes to these days and what you say no, no to mm -hmm. it seems to be more important because there's so much stuff coming down the, the shoot at you. And that kind of a situation, you, you, you're literally just like, wait a second, <laughs> right. you know, like, what, why did I agree to, you know, weekend travel to do something that what, you know, families at home, parents are left high and dry, wife stuck with them. That thing gets blown up. Uh, yeah. I mean, it just, it's just, it's just the everyday challenge of, of life being you know too busy or whatever. 
I, I, I'm not going to sit there and say there was any sort of existential moment or whatever. Where I was just like, ah, this job's terrible. I got to get out of that because it's more sure. important. Than this. I, I didn't go, I didn't go that far. No, it wasn't like that, but you know, it, it recalibrates you a little bit. Yeah. When you see, Humbles when you see, you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of people who are getting messed up in, in this country um, from time to time from various things. And you, th- I thought that they were being taken care of. I, I did. I mean, I just figured that a, a woman in Florida whose house was destroyed by Hurricane Ian um, was taken care of six weeks later. Yeah. You know, you meet her and they're like, yeah, FEMA never showed up and neither did six other volunteer organizations. And you guys are the first ones to show up six weeks after. And you're like, how is that even possible? Right. Like, where have you been living? And she's like, yeah, you know, one woman was in her car. You know, and you're just like, what? She's like, yeah, I grabbed a six pack of beer and my gun and I've been sleeping in my car. <laughs> <laughs> and you just like you're like oh my god how is this even possible but it happens and so it opens your eyes to that stuff so what what is the the purpose of the show to explain and illustrate and show that narrative um to gain more help or appreciation for what's going on what like what's the the storyline behind the show other than what you've conveyed to us so far that's it. This is this is to show the work of Team Rubicon. It's an amazing organization whose volunteers and the work they do um, is easy to profile and should be profiled. And no one needs to take anything else away from that. They don't. I mean, if you want to think about, you know, folks in America not being served by FEMA or whatever, I guess that's you, you can't. But that's really not what it's about. It's about profiling an amazing organization. Um, as as the head of the organization, I think has said on more than one occasion, the largest volunteer organization you've never heard of. Yeah. Uh, so the purpose of this is so that you have heard of this remarkable organization and got a taste for the remarkable people who are part of it. Can you speak to where you feel the with this show and telling the story where the potential that this oper- or that this organization has, like where do you see them headed within the next few years? Well, I think they were only headed up anyway without us. Um, it's got a momentum. Uh, you know what ends up happening when you show up, when five or six gray shirts show up on your property to help you do something um, and you learn more about the organization and people in the community learn more about the organization, you pick up a lot of folks who are just like, holy macro, I didn't know it existed uh, and start joining. So they've already got a very strong grassroots uh, you know, environment going on. So I think the trajectory was only up. This will bring attention to them for sure. It'll all come down to how many people watch it and how viral it goes. And I can't even speak to that. I suspect people will like it when they see it, but it's TV, it's fickle, it's media, you know. Sure. If a shit ton of people watch it, their message will get out and people will fall in love with it pretty easily because it's an easy to love organization. And if a lot of people don't watch it, then they'll just continue to grow organically um, yeah. given their own attributes. So what are the what are the details for the show as far as when it's going to be released, um, all that information? Yeah, so 13 episodes streaming for free on Roku. All episodes drop May 25th. Um, oh. And then once, they'll all drop at once so people can binge or whatever um, as we're recording this at some time next week. Uh, and then they'll live out there on Roku. That's crazy. Everything drops at once. I'm so not used to this. See, I think that... I- so Doug and I have talked about this a lot where it's like the weekly, you know, keeps you hooked and you want to watch the next one. But I, I, I think that the way to do it is just, just drop everything at once and let them consume at their own pace. If I, you I, ask the people on our production side what they thought, you'd hear both answers and split down the middle. I, yeah. I don't know the answer. I don't know which is right, which is wrong. Yeah. No, how, long it, did, how long did it take you guys to do all of this from recording to through production? Like when did this start for you? I think it's been six months. It oh, was, wow. That's fast. It was super fast. Yeah, we, we it was faster than it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of reasons, uh, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it just, like, it's it's hard to get a television show greenlit in general, even when it's your own network or whatever, sure. and, you know, underwrite it. But then you got to put together. This was shot primarily with a, a, a new crew. Right. So our crews for this old house and ask this old house, we're doing the mm-hmm. other show. So, and you got to get a team in the field and you got to, you know, whatever. So, um, it was a very aggressive pace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, on my computer right now, I'm getting pop-ups. Um, we have a, an editing suite software that shows anytime someone makes an addition and they're just, they're just popping up on my screen as I'm talking to you guys, <laughs> this thing is still being edited and tweaked and it's going live and what, how wow. it's, 
that's so, so earlier you said that um this was derived from roku wanting you guys to make more shows obviously yeah. an amazing story behind team rubicon uh but you insinuated that there's other things coming down the pipeline you you mentioned i think you said something about a creator network um what you know as, as much as you can divulge what else are you guys working on so I, I refer to it as the Makers Network. Uh, it exists right now. It's on Roku. So a lot of the folks who you know, Jimmy Duresta, for example, yeah. a lot of makers out there who create content have now got a distribution platform on got Roku. It. So there's a channel that's, that streams you know, around the clock, and we've aggregated their content, and they're making new stuff for it. So the Makers Network is out there, up and running. Um, which is, you know, kind of cool. We're adding people to that network all the time. The other ideas that are being kicked around are, you know, sort of the usual suspects of expansions into some of the very specific fields that we do, mm -hmm. you know, landscaping, masonry, all that kind of stuff. I got nothing to divulge because nothing is certain and I wouldn't be able to, you know, get out in front of it anyway. Sure. Um, so it's, you'll, you'll see it when you see it, I guess. Wait, when you, when you say makers network, I think, you, well, I'm curious because, I feel like there's this really big divide, especially through social media. And when it comes to, you know, the craft where you have the builders and then you have makers and builders and, and contractors like they're, they're, you know, building, right. They're building homes. And then the maker community is, you know, uh, smaller projects. I don't know how to really describe that, but they're very focused, like in a workshop. Yeah. And in my opinion, and, and the way like I'm interested in both. And I think that there is, you know, and, and like I said, there's this really big divide and it's like you either watch, the, you know, either watching this content or watching that content, there's no blend. When you say that this makers network, is it in fact the intent to kind of bring all of this together and, and just have, you know, highlighted focus? I know you, I know you said nothing is set in stone, but highlighted focus in, you know, into all the opportunities related to trade. Well, I think the initial idea was to bring together a bunch of, you know, highly productive content making people with good reputations and give them an additional platform. Sure. Um, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy's a great example. You could see him on YouTube and Instagram, um, you know, maybe TikTok or whatever. But if you just wanted to get access to his content, you had to kind of go there. So why not also put it on a streaming platform like Roku? And so yeah. it was easy for us to identify that community. Same way you guys identified it. You know, who's who's doing what and who's fun to watch on on social media. Um, the, the name Makers Network came because the first scoop of folks who came into it were makers, to your Got point, it. Nick, not professional builders. I don't think they have clients necessarily. Um, you know, John Malecki might be making furniture for a couple of clients, but mostly he's making content. He's showing off his skills. Sure. Um, you know, him and Brad Rodriguez are doing projects at home, whatever. You will see an expansion, I believe, on that channel of professional builders bringing in some of their content or whatever. That's just going to be a function of that channel expanding as it yeah. grows and, and we get more folks out there. The name sounds like it's been siloed, but I don't think it really has. Sure. It, it's a way to bring existing content from people who are um, real on social media to a streaming platform and mm -hmm. do it, I think, with a sensibility that the folks who produce this old house um, bring to it. Yeah. So it's a, probably a little less flashy and gratuitous than some of the other stuff out there. It's generally high skill, even if it's in quirky things, um, but it's generally super high skilled and create very creative. So yeah, it, it's hard to, I mean, Obviously, this old house, I think, is one of the only examples that really follows a build, you know, from yeah. start to finish, you right. know, where I've had conversations about TV shows and it's always like, all right, what project can you do in six weeks? It's always six weeks. And it, it's like, I, I haven't done a, a project in six. I don't think I've ever done a project in six weeks. I'm like, all right, we're just going to change what you do and we'll make a TV show out of it. And ultimately, you know, that's why we don't have a TV show and that's why we film everything ourselves. But you know, that for me, and I think that, you know, probably the, the majority, if not everyone that watches this old house, that's what we want to see. We want to follow a project. We want to fall in love with the the process, the, the, the initial design and, and every step along the way. And, and obviously you get to that final reveal and have that wrap party and get to see the final product. You know, that to me, you know, even if it was dumped in one, one, you know, one swoop into Roku or if it was spread out am amongst a handful of weeks, you know, that's where 
I think there's a lot of value value for our industry, right? As professional builders and, and, and craftspeople where we are like, there's just a lack of it. And, and the opportunity to, to showcase like other professional builders, other guys that are building these big projects and really see what goes into it. Cause I think that that's what everyone wants to, to, to know is like, all right, yeah, that's a beautiful house. You built this amazing house. What did it really take? What were the steps that it took? Like where, where, where was your life sucking during the process and where was it on an extreme high? Right. And, and, and all of that in between, you know, is it, just missing. So you guys asked early on, what is it that I think, you know, is the reason for the show being on for 40 plus years? And I listed a couple of things. That's the one I missed. You got to add that right there. Mm. We show the whole process start to, you know, finish. We take an entire project all the way through. So don't tell any of the other TV shows that that's the simple formula. (laughs) (laughs) They just want to keep telling guys like you to fake it for six weeks so that it can be at a BS production schedule and drop it in some little window or whatever. So, so be it. We're just, that's not what we do. We, we've never had to do it. So we're fortunate. So yeah, that's gotta be on the list of reasons why we're still. Well, I, I think it's on. funny. I, th- I think, I think you're right. I think it's the formula, but it, it that's a, it's a still a hard formula to pull off. It's you very know? hard. Uh, it's, it, there's, I mean, even Rubicon, which was 13 episodes, um, everyone was just like, why 13? Like it should be eight. And we're like, well, why eight? We had a lot to do, but eight's like a number, <laughs> you know? So this, right. it's a system, man. It's a, it's a network. It's a system. It's yeah. people are used to this and used to that. And everyone's just like, well, give me six. How about eight? You know, we're just like, oh, well, 13's half of 26. <laughs> yeah. what we make on the other shows. We've got six months. We do, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a big industry. Um, so, the, so, but what you, I think what you're talking about, Nick, is you're talking about sort of the, the traditional media stuff, right? Yeah. You know, on the social, what you're doing, everyone's not everyone, but a lot of people are doing what you guys are doing, you know, which is film your own stuff and put it out there. And now your access to the audience is, you know, equal to the access that we have to the audience as well, because of the amazing thing of social media and totally. digital, all that kind of stuff. So that is probably scratching that itch for a lot of folks. It, it, it's funny, you know we have a team now and it's like, we have all these people that help with the, the production and filming and editing. And just like, we'll, we'll sit down, we'll expand on it. We'll be like, all right, we got two cameras. We'll write up. We'll, we'll, this is what we're going to talk about. We'll make sure we hit three things. We'll, we'll, we'll do all this post the video. And it's like, why didn't you show more of the process? <laughs> it's like, you missed this. I really wanted to see that. And, and we're like, man, like, how do we, how do we, and we'll never satisfy everyone. We know that. But it's like, how do we keep, like, how, how do we actually capture this in a way where people feel as though they understand the entire process? And yeah. ultimately, like, they never will, right? Like, it's, you know, it, it's it, it's the, the balance between sharing as much as possible, but also keeping it entertaining. And I think yeah. that... It's a balance, right? I mean, we, we always joke, we are not making a how-to video. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, that's how it's being watched. And we do more detail on ask than we do on this old house. Um, but everyone knows that for the most part, when we, as you know, a production team, we're like, we're not making a how-to video. It has to move along. Um, and we're going to drop steps, but that's okay. We're trying to inspire. We're trying to, you know, point out the sticky points or the interesting points or the learning points. Um, you know, we, we're just, we're just not going to dive deep into the four steps of taping drywall. Um, been there, done that. You can look mm-hmm. it up. So it is a balance, you know, that you have to sort of, you, you got to try to keep it in there, but we go heavy on the process, right? You know, as you guys do. And, and that's probably our, that's probably our, uh, yeah, our, 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 our formula, sorry, Tyler, our formula has always been, let's talk about the why and show the how where it's like, yeah, we're not going to give you a step-by-step on how to drywall. First off, we don't drywall in, in this part of Massachusetts, uh, which, nor, everyone, nor do we, but your audience, is which, all which everyone questions every time we post it, but it's always, you know, Hey, show the process, show the guys plastering the wall, show, show the trowel show, like show how it's done, but then we're just going to walk through as to why we're doing it and why it's important to us and why it's important to our brand and our quality and things like that. But this isn't designed to be a how to, because frankly, I'm not going to sit there and tell you how to plaster because I don't know how to plaster. And it's, it would be, it would be, you know, it would be dishonest of me to do that. I can showcase Colby and his team and this is how they're, you know, accomplishing this beautiful work, but that's it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you do you think Kevin that this move with Roku was a necessity for this old house? I get, and I can ala- I can elaborate on that. Um, <clears throat> I know that other other companies that have been the standard within the industry have struggled to transition from either print or traditional media to online and socially driven media. Um, and I think a lot of that is competing with the ability for individuals to create essentially their own shows or their own brand and, and these brand partnerships and everything else. Do you feel that going partnering with Roku and being able to um, put all of your content out there and to be able to stream it was something that was a necessity for you guys to help bridge that gap? If it wasn't a necessity, Tyler, it was definitely a huge advantage. Um, I know what you're talking about with the struggles of some of the other traditional folks in our space who are having trouble growing or surviving. I I believe we've always been a little bit different because we started with video. And a lot of that content that a lot of the legacy content was print first. And they tried to figure out video second uh, because print was good way back when we happened to start as video and fast forward 40 years later video is the king of everything so we were in a very good position so we had a video library and we're constantly making new video uh so i don't know if it was a necessity but we're definitely better off for it because the ability to distribute your your content on every platform everywhere all the time i think helps um you know what's remarkable is i talk about the gigantic size of the pbs platform the number of households because again, PBS is a network like ABC, NBC, and CBS. The federal government says you have to broadcast these four networks. So if you have a television in your house, they have to get those networks. Mm. Um, so that's a huge advantage. But if you then look at the Roku network, which is smaller than that, but very big because it's free, and you look at the demographics of who's on Roku who, versus who's on PBS, you know, PBS is, um, you know, old white couples and Roku is young, you know, millennials, um, who are on the cutting edge of things. I'm PBS, Nick's Roku. (laughs) That's a wild exaggeration. And my phone's going to start ringing in a minute or two about from somebody. But what did you say about PBS? (laughs) You get my point. Um, and so even though PBS is gigantic, it doesn't necessarily mean you get sort of a certain set of eyeballs, which Mm -hmm. is important because you're constantly seeding the next generation and you're constantly trying to bring an enthusiasm to it. So I don't know if necessity is the right word, um, Tyler, but it's a very good place to be. Yeah. And I mean, we knew we were for sale and I was in my head trying to think who's going to buy us. And, you know, like discovery that owns HGTV and DIY, I was thinking, Oh, they must be it. And when Roku popped up and became the person who, who ended up buying us and I found out that they were going to keep us on PBS. I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. My big fear is that we would get traded off of PBS. And I think that's a big part of our legacy and our trust, mm-hmm. you know, Mark. And, and, it, and it has rules that come with being on PBS in terms of, you know, just yesterday I was in the studio and I was doing direct to camera for something and they put a piece of tape on the logo on my shirt. And I was like, guys, it's, it's a quarter of an inch by three quarters of an inch. And they're like, doesn't matter. And we taped it up, you know, so that level of trust that comes from being on PBS, we got to keep when Roku said, you guys can stay on PBS. We love it on PBS and we'll also run it on Roku. So it was huge for us. Yeah. I mean, obviously we don't understand the capacity of the business transaction there, but from an outsider's perspective, it's somewhat of a perfect scenario. Um, I agree. And it, it, you get to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. And I mean, even thinking about what other publications have been through, and I think that we've always, at least modern craftsmen have seen you guys as being immune to a lot of what other people experienced. I do think moving forward, the biggest challenge for somebody who uh, is production heavy and it, it takes a lot of time and I'm sure a lot of money to produce your show. And now you have these people who are able to put out shows with one or two cameras and cost no money at all and be able to put a show out within a matter of weeks, um, having the platform that you guys do remaining on PBS and also having the Roku platform is is a, a huge benefit and advantage for you guys. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about, I don't know what happened with the podcast you guys are putting out. I've really liked them. I listened to a few of them. They're like very well produced and professional. I was like, these guys are going to, these guys are going to put us under, um, what, what, I, I'm sure that that's part of the entire branching out and trying to get into different markets and everything else. But what did you guys find was the issue with the podcast platform or why did it not work out for you guys? So we did clear story, uh, podcast, which was two seasons. If I recall, I think it was maybe 10 episodes a season. So maybe we put out 20 or maybe it was eight or nine. I forget, but, um, it worked perfectly fine. Um, it, I don't have all the specifics, although I've been looking for them because it just came up yesterday. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but it was very well received. We had a built in audience, uh, from the Dissel house fan base. We were in the top half of the 1% on Apple downloads and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I do agree with you and I thank you for that. I think it was well done and, and nicely produced when Roku bought us, they only do video. Um, and when they absorbed us into the company, we had a magazine, um, a YouTube page. Uh, we had some affiliated marketing. We had two television shows and they bought the television shows and the library. And so the first thing that everyone and, and management who was with us prior to the acquisition stayed and became Roku employees. And they got the marching orders from Roku. Uh, and the first thing they said was video first, video only. Give us more of it as fast as you can. Mm. So they reshuffled all of the resources and they said, everything goes towards making video. Um, and even though clear story was popular and also profitable, although not, you know, margin wise, not very profitable from what I understand. Um, it didn't matter. It just got pushed to the side and it was everything video. So immediately we went out and we created 50% more episodes. So my driving to the, recording studio and reading the books and doing the interviews yeah. for the story and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden we make 26 episodes of ask and 26 episodes of this old house that takes up most of my time. And that goes up by 50%. We just, you know, picked our spots and mm. we put clear story to the side. Um, interestingly, just, you know, within the last week, they've come back to us and have said, you know, get the, get the podcast conversation going again and all that kind of stuff. So we'll see where it goes. Um, even if they said, bring it back, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it comes back in the same form, if I'm involved or not, you know, Rubicon's now on my plate and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that's the, that's the rationale, you know, the, the, the acquisition and Roku said video first video only. Um, and so we've been there now for around two years, I think. Yeah, so it all happened around the same time. That makes sense. Oh yeah, it absolutely happened. We were we were putting out the last couple episodes. We were buttoning up the last couple episodes of the second season when the acquisition happened, and that was made clear, you know, within weeks that yeah. it's all hands on deck for video. So, Kevin, but, it may, but it may come back, or or some, something else may come back. They're talking about they the Roku just you know sent us a a, a podcast company and said take a meeting. I, I'm not in on that stuff. That's above my pay grade, but that's you know that's happening. So we'll see where that goes. Kevin, I think one of the most uh, relatable things that is going to be part of this conversation is all of the things that are on your plate. You know, you have, you know, you, you increase your workload by 50% with Ask in this old house. You add Team Rubicon onto, onto your plate. You're traveling. You're, you're, you're doing all of these things. You're leaving your family last minute. I think a lot of people that are listening to this, you know, while maybe they don't host a TV show or travel around the country to host a game show or be at a fancy party they do resonate that sounds, that sounds so effing obnoxious i can't believe <laughs> i can't believe that you could summarize what i said that way but i know that you summarized it correctly and now i want to retract that entire story he's for been second, all, he's I, I only thought, been to one fancy party. for a second i thought nick was describing himself and then i was like i oh, know this is kevin yeah, my i was at a fancy party last night can we can we just can we start again and just i'm just gonna cut that out oh, <laughs> gross listen every terrible <laughs> the raw bar was terrible yeah Shrimp oh my was God. They used this, they used they used well drinks and the raw <laughs> bar was warm. Oh, how did I make it through? Uh, it was it was yeah. a warm raw bar sounds disgusting. Like well, like you 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 took now you feel bottle, my pain. Yeah, now, now I feel you your pain. pain. Um, but 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 seriously, like I think that 
I, I, I mean, I can relate and in, in not in, in terms of like having a lot on your plate, but I know a lot of people that are listening to this can also relate, you know, whether it's an owner operator that is working 80 hours a week and not, not seeing his kid on the weekends or a c- client calls and says, you need to get over here and fix my fireplace right away on a Sunday afternoon. And they're leaving their kids baseball game, whatever the case is, or, or a contractor that wants to do social media or wants to start a podcast or, or, or venture into another opportunity. The, the, the question is, is with everything that you have going on, you know, there's the the work side of Kevin that is, you know, ultimately someone is pulling the strings on that. You're saying yes to some, no to most, um, and balancing that. But when you flip it back to your family and your kids and the time that you get to spend with them and your parents visiting, what is that balance? And and and, and or how do you balance it? Or you know, how do you work through the challenge of balancing it? So let me start by saying, you know, when they ask us to do 50% more of something or come up with new shows, there's an entire group of us at this old house. Sure. And that ask is going to everybody. Right. Um, so, you know, so there's I'm no not doubt. The person making, you know, 50% more shows. Richard is, Tom is, the producers are, you know, so that has to be said. Everyone was asked to do more in a very short period of time. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, how it gets done is lots of adjustments, right? And so production reacts to it and they start moving me around and trading me differently from one show or another and cut back here or make, you know, changes there as much as they can. Um, I make adjustments, you know, I dropped the speaking business. I did the home shows like crazy and just stopped doing those because there was no bandwidth to do it. Um, and just put that aside. Uh, and you, you lean on the people you love, you know, so my wife picks up a lot of that slack, um, as best she can. Um, you know, she's back to work mostly full time now too. So that's a burden to it, but you know, she and I ping pong very well together, you know, doing that kind of stuff. And, and let's, let's be honest, you know, every fourth week, one of us, usually her will say, Hey, you're being a prick. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Stop. And you're like, Whoa, what are you talking about? And then you're like, Oh yeah, I guess I am. Oh my God. Well, you know, I've been away and she's like, whatever. It doesn't matter what, right. why reset. You know, you gotta, you reset you got to fix it so you have that if you're lucky in your life to be like mm-hmm. okay you know someone who can speak truth to idiocy um so she does that uh and i adjust as best i can people around me adjust as best i can and stuff falls off the list until it works um and sometimes it doesn't you know there have been moments where it hasn't worked and i find myself not talking to a 17 year old longer than i should because dad's short and he's whatever and that's it helps you reset if you do it well so it's 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 never ending um we've decided not to give up on the battle Mm -hmm. because for the most part the opportunities are good they're engaging um you know my wife and i just had this conversation now that she's back to work and she's up to her eyeballs there and she's like you know maybe i shouldn't and should pull back and i'm like you can't really do that because you know giving your age and the kids getting ready to you know go off to high school and college she can see around the corner it's a little early because they still need her full time but she, she can see around the corner and so when a professional opportunity that's stimulating and engaging and local comes along sooner than it should mm. she needs to jump on it and i need to support her so you, we've just made decisions and tried to up our game a little bit to make them all happen. And I just happen to be very fortunate with a remarkable support team. It's not even a support team, just a remarkable team around us mm-hmm. um, that helps make it happen. If if I had been asked, that's for example, if I had been asked to do another show by another production company, it would have been an easy no. Um, because that's a whole different thing. When you're asked to do it for the existing production company, your team, the people I work with every single day, then you know that we can make it happen because the guy who's working with me on the job site um, for this old house is the one who's sending me to Mississippi instead of Puerto Rico. Um, you know, And the woman who's running the Ask show is looking at cuts and helping produce Rubicon. It's the same team. Yeah. And so we all, realize that we've got to make it happen. Everyone There's, wanted it for the organization. Right. They're, they're, it's, they're self vetting it. It's, it's an opportunity that has been vetted probably before it even makes it to, to you. 
Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're not going to ask me to do it if they looked at the board and said it's impossible. Right. Or, or like, hey, Kevin's probably going to say no, but let's pitch it. No, but even if you said yes, if they looked at it and said we know what we need from him, and that's going to be too disruptive to the other things, then they mm-hmm. wouldn't have asked. Mm-hmm. What they probably did was say we'd like to have him. Let's see if it would work. And they you know moved the board around and said yeah, we probably can make it work, but we're going to have to change this and change that. Uh, and then once they sort of got square with that, then they come to you and say, hey, would you like to do it? Wait, uh, so wait. Next- with with all the added stuff on your plate right now, has what has been whether it's personal or business the hardest thing that you've had to push to the side? I know you mentioned your kids recently, but I mean, if there's anything other than that that you've just not had time for that you had time for before that you wish you could get that back. I mean, it's definitely the family stuff because the, the, you know, I'll I'll call them the business opportunities or the production opportunities. They come and go and they are what they are. Um, It's definitely, it's just, the easy answer is it's just the family stuff. You know, it's, it's the missed games and the silence at dinner because you're exhausted or <laughs> something like that. And you're like, oh my God, I'm just being an awful father right now. I am not asking, you know, how, why, what, engage in type of thing. Uh, and you realize you, you just don't get them back. Um, we do take time in the family to explain to them um, that we've made the decision to do that and that we're, we're doing it and asking the kids for their support. But we also point out, you know, that there are certain things that they're very fortunate to have and that comes from a place and it comes from the work that my wife and I are doing. And so I think they get it. Um, I don't they, know. I they, grow, get I it when they, they get it when they want to get it. No, but I think they understand, Yeah, you know, um, that, that some of the things that they're able to do, um, you know, my, my son after COVID, went from loving school to hating school. And he's like, I don't want to go to senior high school. And we were like, well, you got two choices. You know, you change your attitude or you change your location. And because he had gone on a couple of trips uh, in some Spanish speaking countries, you know, I said, well, what if you studied in Spain for a semester of high school? And he's like, could I do that? And I was like, let's find out together. And, you know, a month later, he was enrolled in a Spanish high school and went over and became fluent. And we were able to write a check to pull him out of our public high school and send him over there and put him in with a family and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a gigantic check, but you had to fly them over there and, you know, find the company to make it happen. And our ability to do that is based upon the fortunate situation we're in because we, you know, work at it. So we remind them mm-hmm. that, yep, I missed a couple things, kiddo. I missed a couple things, um, but I got a couple things right. You got to go to Spain and that happens. Yeah. My, my kids aren't there yet. It's like, they walk outside in the middle of winter and leave the door open. I'm like, the heat's on. Don't you understand that costs us money? They're like, how does the heat cost money? <laughs> I'm like, they're just too young. My my kids like, just go to the bank and get it. Yeah. I'm like, you know, the money that's in the bank is ours. And they're like, who put it there? I'm like, I did working. They're like, you get money for working? I'm like, oh God. I'm like, we need, I need ten more years. Now they then... just make fun of me for turning the lights off all the time. Tyler. Yeah nine that your oldest daughter's nine yeah and she's the oldest of all your kids right yeah yeah five and six kids yeah so yeah they're, they're, they're not telling you they get it but it's sinking in trust me it's sinking in because in about two or three years when they're 11 12 13 they'll be repeating it back to you in a real snarky manner oh yeah ver- verbatim and you'll be like oh you were listening yeah <laughs> it, it, i'm not looking forward to that yet God it's, forbid if you ever leave the door open, Tyler. Oh, gone. It's over. <laughs> you're, you're, you're daughter, daughter. It's over. My six <laughs> year my six year old already does that to me. I'm like, don't start. Yeah. The best uh the best thing the best story about money is my Meg got a um a parking ticket and she made a comment like, Oh God, like it was so much money that now she has no money. <laughs> and the kids went to school and like told everyone that like we have no more money you know, because my mom got a parking ticket and like, we're like, just, that was it. That was like the whole story. And every, anytime we went somewhere, she's like, do you want, they would always bring their money. Like they have a little bag and like coins and stuff. They're like, do you want, do you want me to pay for it? And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of good. Like I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of loving this, but then they forget that target costs money to go to. So. Right. Well, back when my kids were that age, they thought I was a carpenter. So it just goes to show that the kids don't know much. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, 
So we've had a, we've had a handful of conversations with you, Kevin, as far as where the industry is headed, what the the labor pool looks like. Um, not to beat a dead horse there, but I think that since we've spoken, it's been a few years and a lot has changed. Obviously, COVID, post COVID, uh, the industry is booming. There's a ton of work. We still are struggling to put people in place. Um, but being that. Nick and I uh, are out there socially pushing um, what we want to be doing. You obviously have your hand in this old house and putting off um, really good energy and advocating for the trades. Do you think, where do you think the industry stands right now as far as um, even social media and what everyone's doing to promote trades and promote craft? Do you feel that it's any different than it was whatever it was four or five years ago when we spoke or we're, we're in the same situation? No, I, I think it's different. I think two things have changed that I can share with you. I think um, public sentiment has changed over that period of time. My thinking on some of it has changed as well. Um, the, I, the pendulum feels like it's swinging a little bit the other way. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, if five or 10 years ago, college was the be all end all and the trades were the ugly stepchild or stepbrother of that situation. Um, a lot of things that have happened in the country and on a macro level have switched that to tarnish the college degree a little bit and to polish the yeah. um, work with your hands reputation a little bit as well. You know, whether it is people questioning the value of the college education, given the price increases, um, you talk about for giving a trillion dollars of college debt on a national basis, that conversation is going to cause a lot of people to say, what is the value or what is the detriment to being in debt so much? Um, and so those types of conversations, I think, as I say, have tarnished um, that perfect, beautiful college degree that everyone was saying you must have. Um, I think the effort of folks like you and the pushback on social media from people who've been in the industry talking about it has done a lot to elevate the trades, um, at least visually. Um, so I think that has caused the deterioration to stop and maybe it moving a little bit back in the direction of the pendulum sort of swinging back a little bit. That being said, um, a very robust economy, tons of demand for labor, construction and such, a trillion dollars of extra money thrown into the system and pent up demand and all that helps quite a bit. Um, it is a lot easier to sell people on the notion that maybe not college uh, instead of the trades when there are a lot of jobs in the trades. If 2008 ever happens again and a million plus get washed out of the industry, it's going to be hard to keep that narrative going. But for now, um, the demand helps a lot. Personally, you know, my view on it a little bit um, has become, I don't know if pessimistic is the right answer. I've been a little more introspective and wondering, wondering if we had the narrative right, you know, going back to the conversation that we had above the garage um, during that podcast and subsequent ones that we've had collectively. Um, I think we spent a lot of time saying that the image was wrong. Um, my new take on it is, are the trades doing all they can to improve themselves? So are they asking all the right questions? Are they doing all the right things? And mm. in many instances, I sadly think the answer is no. I think we're sort of hurting ourselves and falling down. The low productivity, you know, bad mentorship, not mm. great training, sort of fundamental structural things that the industry still hasn't gotten right that I think will permanently constrain its ability to both grow and also both to attract folks. So that's a mouthful, but that's kind of where my head is. No, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, I've said it before that I think we did five years ago, we, that was our mission is to promote the trades, to get people interested. And I agree with you, Kevin. I think that now looking back, we did, we did that. Yeah. We, 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 people are interested. I think the pendulum has swung back and there's, you know, becoming this equal, um, respect for college and the trades and maybe even, you know, leaning towards the trades, but, you know, at the same time, we did a lot of bad things. We, we started removing the education and the training, you know, during that time, 
you know, I, I, I talked to the trade school I went to and it, it was every year they were getting rid of more and more programs and they were, they were combining things. And I talked about this a couple episodes ago. It's like they combined auto body and, and auto mechanics, two very different trades. And you know, they combined house carpentry and cabinet making also two very different trades. And they were doing it because the interest wasn't there. And yeah. then the interest spikes and now they, now they can't place these kids. Yeah. Tra the training is a big issue. The other thing I think that is a, a huge issue is, num well, first off, your, your comment about the fact that the trades themselves aren't doing anything to improve, I, I, I would agree with because I think that we, we continue to have this romantic um, you know, relationship with doing everything with our hands. You know, hey, we, I'm not using a CNC. I'm not, I'm not going to buy panelized walls. I'm not buying trusses. I'll, I'll cut the roof by hand. And, you know, and what we're doing is we're, we're, we're increasing the reliance of human beings to build homes. At the same time, we're making the homes bigger, more complicated, and, and, and more room for error, which then drives the issue with, you know, of course, like failures, like I'm watching buildings be built in my own city. And it's, you know, every building that gets built within two years has scaffolding on the outside because something was done wrong. Mm. And it's because they're looking at speed, speed over, over uh, quality. And, and, and that goes into my, my last point is that I also think that we have this, th there's this unnecessary pressure on our trades. And I mean, like the guys in the field that they need to, you know, take a haircut on the work that they're doing. And we're, we're giving them these false promises like, Hey, you know, I really need you to, to do this job, you know, for 10, 15% less. Cause don't worry, I'll, I'll give you every other job that I got going on. But like, I just, you know, I'm you're, you're over budget and, and I need you to be within budget. It's like, you're, I'm not over budget. No, you didn't budget correctly. And what you're, and what they're doing is like these, these professional air quote builders are essentially going to market selling a premium product and then turning around and figuring out how can I accomplish this for the least amount of money as possible. And oftentimes it's the guys in the field that take the haircut that don't ever have the opportunity to put money in the bank. And then when, when shit does hit the fan, they don't have a, a, a nest egg. They don't have anything to help their, 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 their uh, family to survive. They don't have any life savings saved up because they've always just worked just to, to cover the expense at, for the benefit of the relationship with these professional builders and at the, what that's doing beyond hurting them, but it's also in, in, you know, deflating the cost of what this stuff should cost. So now it's like, you go and look, you know, it's like, Oh, I want to build a, you know, these massive homes. And it's like, you know, Oh, I'm, I built, I built my two, my 10,000 square foot home for $200 a square foot. It's like, but did you, like at two hundred dollars a square foot, did you act? Did you build that ten thousand square foot McMansion? And did everyone that was involved in that project get paid, or did they get paid appropriately for their trade? Right. And that's and I think that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue is that we just continue to drive the the visual of what this stuff costs. So people are building these bigger and more complicated homes never paying what's appropriate to actually accomplish them. And then we're just creating this huge divide between the guys that are the, selling the work and the guys that are actually performing the work. I thought mine was a mouthful. You got a lot. Yeah, a lot. That, that was a mouthful. You're, you're a better speaker than I though. No, 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 no. It's, it just, it, there's a lot of points that you hit on there and that I'm not sure quite which ones to dive in on, but I think I'll start with the first one that I think I heard you make, um, which I de definitely agree with, which is this, sort of, you know, putting the burden on the, the laborer, if you will, the craftsperson to do sort of everything by hand and, and to turn their backs on, you know, things that are uh, either automation or productivity. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, I don't know, we had, we had the fight, you know, with Johnny or whatever, over this kind of stuff. The, the romantic nature, that was the word that sort of came up yeah. um, a lot with that whole thing. But, I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time reading about this, looking into this, and I'll just share a couple of things with you that I firmly believe are structural flaws with the industry that hold a lot of people back. Um, productivity is key, right? And if you look at productivity for the construction industry, and you go back to say the end of World War II, right? So let's talk about 1940, 
ends in 44, let's say 1945 forward, productivity in construction is essentially flat. So the annual productivity gain, you know, year over year is flat. And if you compare that to things like agriculture um, or manufacturing or even retail, mm -hmm. those are up 1500%. Mm -hmm. you know, it's staggering to see other industries that go crazy with productivity. Um, and it's not hard to think about because the farm from 1945, which might have been small on a family farm, is probably now a giant agribusiness being farmed by a cat tractor that's being driven by GPS, um, you know, to steer it and maximize its turns and coverage and also a watering system that's measuring every drop and, you know, surrounding temperature and humidity and all that type of stuff. So, you know, you can see why those things help. And productivity translates into margin and wages. Um, and if you even look at it within a more contemporary time period, productivity gains, let's call it 20 years, as long as you, you and I and, and other people our age have been in and around this industry, productivity and construction has been growing at 1%. You know, the world economy's productivity has been growing at 2.8%. So 2.8 times as fast as construction. And if you look at manufacturing, it's like 3.8%. So, and anyone who knows how small changes in growth factors over long periods of time happen, whether it's compounding interest or discount mm -hmm. rates, or whatever, small differences like 1%, 3.8% are huge. They're absolutely huge. And this industry has just not adopted wide scale productivity. It is still vastly an industry filled with very small companies. Um, you know, I'm going to get some of these stats wrong because sure. they're most of a memory, but if there were 600 construction companies in the country, 25% of them are a single individual and 90 plus percent of them are fewer than 20 people, which make them small businesses. It is hard to embrace technology and climb up the productivity ladder on your own mm -hmm. or in a very small group. Um, Nick, I know you went to see our friend, Ted Benson, Ted Benson. I I was just, just thinking about him. Yeah. And, and I also was listening. Um, I, I remember hearing a conversation that you guys had way back when with panel, the Cape Cod panel guys. Yep. I actually went back and listened to that prior to this, this podcast, um, what we're doing right now. And you, you won't remember this statistic because you didn't go back and listen to it like I just did. But the, the guy who was primarily talking there, when you asked him what have been the results of taking the, the, the framing process indoors, he said our man hours decreased by 56%, 33,000 man hours down to about 14,500. And his gross revenue went up 60%. 56% decline in man hours and a 60 plus percent increase in revenue means margins, profit, investment, mm -hmm. good pay and stable pay. And if you think about what he did to create that company, to create an indoor facility that the guys aren't down on their knees, create enough of a flow of business so that they could all be busy all of the time. I mean, it's a small version of what Ted Benson did. Yeah. Productivity has not been embraced by this industry and it's just borne out by the numbers. And it's very difficult to do it when you're a mom and pop shop or even when you have five or 10 people, it's just very hard to do. And it continues to be that type of an industry. And, and those are some of the sort of structural things that made me pessimistic because mm -hmm. this industry still embraces that. People I work with still do it. Um, they still rely on this network of subs. And, and I mean, I could go even deeper. If you break productivity down, if you look at the construction industry and breaks the small construction from the big construction, the civil construction, the, the larger engineering, the municipal projects, those are 20 to 40% more, product, more productive than the small guys. 100%. It, it's unbelievable. You it's so crazy to believe that because every time I drive by them, there's like six guys standing around <laughs> one dude with a shovel. We, we yeah. must yeah, really but then you, be but productive. The, <laughs> but then you watch them replace a bridge in 48 hours. Yeah. And yeah. it's and it's because they're thinking about tech, like we uh, the Mass Pike they did I think it was I think it was Comav I forget what bridge it was they built that whole bridge off site and 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 moved it in and craned it in place yeah and if I mean if you're not productive um, 
I've, I've looked at a lot of surveys that you know, make a list of what young people want out of a, a profession, out of a mm. career. You know, they want meaningful work. Well, they, they all want good pay. Yeah. That's number one on the list. Oh, they want good pay, but they want meaningful and impactful work. Mm-hmm. Um, but they also want a path to advancement. And when you dig into the path to advancement, it includes mentorship and exposure to technology. Mm-hmm. So if you think about the subcontractor, the one or two carpenter, you know, the, 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 the company with one or two carpenters are on the job site every day, there's very little mentorship there. There's mm-hmm. very little sort of see one, do one, teach one type of thing going on. Um, and there's very little technology that they're exposed to. If you leap forward and look at Ted Benson's guys who were in that factory that you were in, and you look at the Hun digger and the sophistication of that machine and the software driving that, and the sort of group think of continual learning. Um, I watched that video of you up there, Nick, and those guys on that factory line, if you will, were still wearing their bags. Mm-hmm. You know, they still had their tool belts on and their hammers there, and they were carpenters. Of course. And I've had many conversations with Ted Benson about this. I mean, he is a to me, he's one of my biggest mentors in this. You know, and when when I first saw his operation and said, you want to the most traditional form of building timber framing the most important guy in that industry ted benson is going to timber frame with german cnc machines hundiggers and such like what are you doing this is heresy and he was like kevin there isn't a single carpenter here there isn't a single timber framer here who wants to spend his entire day hogging out mortises Mm -hmm. let the machines do it they want to come up with the elegant solutions the fine tuning the design, the creativity, and it took a while for that to sink in. But the brute force that it takes to do what most of these guys do on a job site in these small groups is brutal. Yeah. Isolating. It lacks mentorship. It lacks tech exposure to technology. Um, and we as a industry collectively scratch our head and say, why doesn't anybody want to do this? And why do they all want to go to college? Well, guess what? <laughs> A lot of it sucks, and it's a self-inflicted wound. Yeah, Sorry. it's like, hey, we're you... gonna we're gonna bring you in as an apprentice. You gotta mortise these, you know, forty timbers, and then we'll talk about your the next thing you can do. It's I like... learned, I learned how to, you know, pound <laughs> nails by hand. Right, good for you. I I had to bring those shingles up to the roof on my back, two bundles at a time. Does it make so... you better? Like and you wonder why no one wants to go into the business. What do you ladder. feel? What do you feel we could do, based on our current situation with all these small companies? Like, what is something that we can implement to help move things forward? Because it it is so difficult. And you look at the bigger companies, and they have the the money and the asset to be able to reinvent, reinvest, and be able to grow. But it it we are stunting our own growth but it's almost by necessity because most people wouldn't be able to survive if they weren't small and they weren't lean. So like, what's the, what's something that we can implement to start to make a change? Grow in a word, grow. If you, and I have got absolutely no problem with the, the sole operator. I've got no problem at all. If um, the person wants to be, out on their own or just a couple guys doing what they do. But if you do that, I would suggest that is the deal that you have made and you will have to deal with the consequences, which means you'll be fighting on price. You'll be subject to the big boy kicking you around. Um, and you're most likely not going to be able to retain people. Growth allows you like the guys at Cape Cod panels to grow a business big enough to keep everybody busy and to have enough money left over to reinvest in the equipment or the environment so that they're inside and they're not breaking their back and they get to do more and they get to use their brain to figure it out. One of the things, I wish I could remember the names, I apologize to them that I don't, but you know, one of them was just like, it took us a while to figure out, but we ship a lot of walls and we don't ship the roofs because shipping roofs is air, shipping air, super expensive. Well, they figured that out. That's a lot of brain work, but once they figured it out, it helped them become more efficient and better at what they do. And that efficiency fed them to be higher margin, more profitable and to grow so that they can grow that. You got to grow. Tyler, I, 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 I apologize. I have not followed your stuff. Um, I, I've not caught up. What, 
is it still you and the guy? How many guys? One, two guys? No, nah, me right now, subbing some stuff out. I'm actually bringing somebody else on part-time. Um, but I have scaled back just for peace of mind, lean out, make more money, um, do smaller projects. And it, it's worked for me. But obviously, it is, it's what you say. It's live by the sword, die by the sword. Yeah. So, I mean, I, again, I totally respect that. I, and, and I think that's perfectly fine. But I just think you're in a situation where you're not going to be in a position to mentor young kids and to show them or bring them through. They're probably the people who are going to end up being in this profession when you are done and I am done are not people who are going to come through um, Tyler's company. Like you're just not going to have that effect on a lot of people. Whereas, you know, Benson would or Cape Cod Panels would or Nick, I don't know what you're up to now. But it seems to me that you've taken on some of the specialization and the reinvesting in the cabinet shop and machines and all that kind of stuff. So you'll probably have more of an impact on bringing up the next generation and making it worthwhile. So, again, it's not it's not throwing shade on anybody. It's just that as an industry, Nick's probably going to have more of an impact on the young people coming through and an ability to impact them. And if he got bigger and more efficient like Benson would, he'd have an even bigger impact. So I, I hate to say it, I'm not talking about the whole world being run by production builders who are public companies, but growth leads to productivity, leads to higher margins, leads to a better work life. And that's what will elevate, in my opinion, this trade to make it competitive. And I think that that last point to be competitive is important, you know, and I think that oftentimes when I talk about guys need to make more money and we, we got to build smaller houses for higher dollar per square foot, it's not because I w- we want to make more money. It's because we want to make, uh, make a, a larger margin to pay people appropriately. Yeah. That's what it's about. I think the, yeah. gro- the, 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 you know, I'm in agreement with the, the growth because, you know, the, for Tyler's sake, like I get why he's a one man show. And I think that from like the mental clarity side of it, like it's worth that to, to him. I, I was, I couldn't do it. I, I thought I wanted to be a one man show for a long time. Now we're growing and, and we continue to grow and, you know, and, but we continue to struggle with, you know, teaching. Um, but I had a, a, a meeting today with an architect and we were talking about, you know, why I, we wouldn't be a good fit for some of their clients. And, and the reason we wouldn't be a good fit is because we were too big and that some clients would rather spend half a million dollars less working with a guy in his truck or mm. a, a one man show like Tyler. And, mm-hmm. and, and I fully respect that. But the, what it came down to is like the expectation is oftentimes not set with what that difference is. And what the difference is, is when you work with us, you're going to have a project management team. You're going to have a site super. You're going to have a project manager. You're going to have a a, a a budget that's updated on a daily basis. You're going to get reporting. You're going to get cash flow projections. You're going to get us like you're getting all of this stuff because there's multiple people involved in your project. When you're working with someone like Tyler, it's, he's the guy on site. He's not then going to go home and take time away from his family to update the cash flow projection or yeah. update, uh, update the, and nor should he. And, yeah. and, and I think that when we, you know, when we price work, oftentimes, you know, we're, we already know we have the job, but there's times where we might bit quote unquote bid a job, which is usually like a verbal estimate and so on and so forth. But my first question is, well, who else is looking at this job? Like, oh, we don't want to disclose that information. I'm like, well, to be fair, if, if, you know, Tyler's looking at the job, I, I can't look at, we can't price this job. Like you're, you're, you're asking for two completely different approaches to this. And, you know, that, you know, from a client's perspective is something that oftentimes just gets masked where it's yeah. like, oh, Tyler's, you know, half a million dollars less than, than Nick is. It's like, but they're not doing the same thing. I, I totally get that. I also think, though, that there's a lot of people in this business that don't fully understand the, the nuances of the industry that they're in. And if you'll bear with me, I think you guys, I think most of your audience will appreciate this. You know, we are, we started earlier, Tyler, talking about other companies that are in publishing and television, mostly print, that have sort of fallen by the wayside or are struggling. The media industry on the print side in general has been devastated by the creation of Google. Let's just take a very simple example. So Facebook and Google go and they take all of the content and they distribute it for free and then generate ad revenue. 
So the New York Times pays the journalists, does the investigation, writes the articles, puts the headlines out, creates this massive organization of high quality journalism, them and the Wall Street Journal and the New York, Washington Post, whatever. And then Google and Facebook steal all the content and put it out there for free. And everyone's just reading snippets on there and they're making the, the billions of dollars in ad revenue, right? So someone came along and moved the media industry's cheese on them. Well, that's an example. And that's, an, that's like a structural flaw with the print media. And they got decimated by it. And the jobs got shittier and they got fewer. And everyone suffered in that industry along the way. That's been happening in construction for a very long time. And think about this, as it's become more difficult to attract people to the trade for various reasons, um, big industry has solved a lot of these problems. This is a thing that I call sum into one. Okay, so some things, multiple things reduced into one. And it first dawned on me when I was talking to Richard Trithui, and you know the, the difficulty in finding a guy to come out and service your oil burner um, or your gas furnace or stuff like that. It was so difficult to find technicians who knew what they were doing and can work on all these things that the manufacturers couldn't sell enough of this stuff. So they started making the components basically modular and two things went on. The repair guy could come in and he could plug a probe into the electronics on the circuit board and it would tell him what was wrong, right? He didn't have to go and diagnose everything because there weren't enough smart guys to do it. So they, the manufacturers created something that would tell them what was wrong. And the other thing that they did was they basically made the parts that often had to be repaired interchangeable. Pull them out, order a new one, put it in. And everyone would complain, well, why do you guys just throw all this stuff up? That's how they solved the problem of too few technicians to do this stuff. And that's been going on in the construction industry all of the time. Think about all of the products that you guys touch. I'll use zip walls, for example two or three layers of sheathing and, and WRB and all that stuff, which required your guys to go around the house two or three times, that manufacturer reduced those two or three steps into one. And now you all pay, what do you pay for a sheet of that stuff, Nick? Zip, I, I don't even know. I'm, it's, I'm it's, it's an exorbitant amount. Yeah. Right? I'm removed from it at this point. Okay. Tyler, I mean, this happens. Tyler probably knows better than this I do. All over the place. But my point is, is that Huber is the billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. They moved your cheese, right? They're the ones who are making the high margins and growing their businesses. And they're the billion dollar company. And they've cobbled together those 600,000 construction firms and made it essential that you buy their product because it took some processes and reduced it into one. And it goes right down the line. I mean, Schluter is doing the waterproofing over plywood because you can't hire, you know, the Ferranti brothers to do an old fashioned copper pan and a mud job because it's too effing complicated or there aren't enough people there. So the manufacturer came up with a way to take some jobs and reduce it into one so that a carpenter can now waterproof and basically build the bathroom. Um, and they're making the margins, guys. They're the ones who are turning into the $100 million companies selling you this shit all the time, which is great. It's all good. It's solving a problem. But, you know, it's like the it's like the frog in the frying pan that's boiling really slowly. He doesn't know he's being cooked. The media, it, the newspapers are losing their shirt by Google taking all their shit from them. And Huber and Schluter are getting all the margins because you all can't find enough skilled laborers on the job. So they're solving the problem another way. They've innovated, they've grown, they've embraced technology, and the, unto them go the spoils. Hmm. It, it, it's funny, like there, those are great examples where, but but you'll have that same carpenter that will cut the zip and install it on the wall, do the taping and everything else, but won't consider panelizing the wall. It's like, no, I got to build this wall by hand. Exactly. It's like, but why? Why? And, and, you know, Why? anyone that listened to that podcast, like I'm, Mike Riley's, uh, you know, one of the guys at Cape Cod panel along with John and Joel, but, you know, I'm chatting with Mike right now about a project and, you know, we were talking internally, like, why do you want to panelize this? I'm like, I'd love to work with Ted Benson on this project. We don't like, I have, you know, the particular project is a, a spec for us. So I have a very finite amount of dollars I can spend. And I told Ted, I'm like, not this one, next one. Um, but. I'm like, hey, we can we can at least panelize it. 
And the question came up is like, what are we going to benefit from that? I'm like, what are we going to benefit? I'm like, I watched them cut a whole entire house of two by fours. And it went into a, the, the scrap was a 55 gallon bucket of scrap. And they were all less than an inch long because they, because a computer told them how to maximize a, a, a 21 foot two by four. No human being could, I mean, I shouldn't say that a human being could do that. It would be enormously expensive because they would spend hours getting to that result. And this is the conversation I have with Ken, who's in my mill workshop, where it's like the the reality is, is like we yeah, we love to build stuff with our hands and, and, and no doubt. But when you price something and you realize how much time it takes and you go to the client and says, yeah, like this credenza is going to be fifteen thousand dollars. It's like 15. I can't. I, I want to spend five. Yeah. It's like, oh, then we need to make a simpler one. I'm like, stop. I'm like, what if we don't make a simpler one and we spend an hour and we program all of these parts to be cut on a CNC? It's like, aren't we now allowing us to hit the creativity that we want? Because the other, otherwise, if you still build it by hand, you build something for $5,000, it's not going to be creative. You're not going to be able to do anything special because you are trying to figure out your how many man hours it's going to take. But if you can shift the man hours and put it into a computer and then you get get to the end result, the product being this really cool, creative $15,000 credenza, which you can actually sell for 5000 with a, an appropriate margin because you utilize technology. Isn't that a better result for everyone involved? The answer is obviously yes, Nick. And I would add one thing that you also did was if you look at the list of what people want and from their jobs, you know, good pay, meaningful, impactful work, but a path to advancement. And that means exposure to technology. Mm -hmm. So not only have you created the efficiencies and potentially higher margins, but you've introduced brain work and technology and the young kids insist on it. I got an 18 year old um, who mines his own Bitcoin, builds his own computers knows his way around every piece of electronics in my household and his little brother and sister do as well. I wasn't hundred percent sure if he was going to go to college or not, but I knew that no matter what he went into next, it was going to include technology. Even if he went into the trades, he was not going to take a job that didn't include technology because it's all he knows. He's so good at it, exposed to it, all that kind of thing. So what you did in that scenario was not just improve, you know, solve one problem, but you created an environment that also makes it very dynamic and more attractive to young people who might come into this thing. Um, there's just, just, just no way around it. And if you told a lot of people that, listen, I can give you a job, but you'll never touch anything electronic at all, a certain percent of them would rejoice. It'd be a tiny sliver. A much bigger percent of them would say, no, thank you. Right. Because I order my car on my phone and I order my vacation house on my phone and I program, whatever. You get the point. Yeah. Technology. So, uh, you know. It's a structural flaw with this industry. And that's the sort of self-reflective, pessimistic place that I've gotten to that has changed over the last five years, which is more of a realization that it's easy to say the message is wrong. You know, people glamorize college and they shit on the trades. But the reality is, is that a lot of this, I believe, is self-inflicted wounds because the industry has not embraced these things. And therefore is not enjoying the returns or the spoils of they had. Totally. And I think my, my final point on that is I think a lot of what we're talking about is I'm just going to say linear, like from left to right, like the carpenter bringing them to technology. There is the other side of it where it's like, what about the, the team, the people are that are in technology that don't realize that construction is an opportunity for them to, to grow. Yeah. And we had this conversation um, recently with, um, someone at a trade show and we were talking, I had made the reference, you know, they were, they, they were making fun of someone that all they did was play video games. I'm like, you laugh, but that kid might go off and be one of the best BIM coordinators in commercial construction because yeah. he gets it. He gets the yeah. program. He's in, he's in that space. I couldn't tell you how to work through BIM. Yeah. It's like, that's not even on my radar. Yeah. And the reality is, is like that that's the other side of this. We'll call it a funnel where it's like we have this opportunity to, you know, we have the crafts people, but we need the technology people to also understand that craft, uh, that, that construction 
is a, an extremely viable career for for their their skill set. Absolutely, and uh, you know you're, they're using their technology in a, in a way that you know might not be for the corporation that creates some you know programming algorithm that drives ad revenue that they find incredibly unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. They may use their technology to have something physically built at the end of six months um, that they get to see, and that might be just the spark that they need to be like, oh my god, this is what makes my job fulfilling—the tangible, synthetic reality of a something of a of a dwelling be built. That was always the thing that captured my imagination as a kid when I went to my dad's job sites, which was. Was, holy shit something's built like i watched it go from nothing to something you know i was yeah. like wow that's really cool um and people with a lot of technological skills programmers or gamers or what have you there's no doubt that there's a lot of them that have that itch just like mm -hmm. you know some of us had uh, but have never been able to figure out how to connect those two dots and so a, a construction industry that embraced productivity and technology i think by default would grow and attract a broader base to it and that would elevate the entire industry as, as a whole. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I listen, I don't want to sound completely pessimistic. Um, you know, I think there are, as we you know, bringing it back to the pendulum swinging the other way, I think there's movement, you know, uh, that, that are sort of in the favor. Uh, if you look at the statistics, college enrollment is down mm -hmm. generally, um, you know, over a decade or so, I think enrollment's down by 15%. Apprenticeships, as they're categorized, are up 50%. Yeah. You know, so there is a shift, both, I think, on the push and the pull. I think companies are saying, my God, I got to teach these college grads everything anyway. Mm -hmm. So let's create apprenticeships because I'd like to teach them how to do it our way. And, you know, that's sort of on the on the on the push side. But then on the pull side, too, I think a lot of young people have come to realize that they find it more fulfilling to be able to do apprenticeships and have real world training so that they come out so they can be employed at a, yeah. at a high number for a good company. So th those th there are good things happening. There is the yin and the yang. It's just yeah. it, it not, and again, not to be pessimistic, it's just really difficult with there being almost zero standardization within from company to company within residential, with everyone being so small and everyone having their own unique systems and processes and tools and products that they use that are changing from year to year it's like where is the technology the software the systems going to come into place where everyone does everything differently it's it's so hard to imagine that happening the way that things are set up right now i agree a hundred percent and again it's a structural thing that's why i point out the six hundred thousand construction companies with one in four at one person only and 90 plus percent of 20 people or fewer there used to be over a you know 800 car companies didn't work well. There are, there are a handful. And I don't think people in this industry want to hear it, but growth will mean bigger companies. You, you, wait, you may not have fewer people employed. They'll just be employed at bigger companies. You know, there'll be the 150 guys and gals up at Bensonwood who get to survive in that situation and have a, a better work life, um, you know, balance, probably higher pay, better working conditions and such. Uh, and that may be sound like heresy to a lot of people. But if it's going to stay at 600,000 companies where they're mostly one to five people, then we'll probably suffer through those structural flaws. If it gets to, you know, 5,000 companies um, at 200 people at a critical mass where they can be functional and, and productive um, and efficient, then everyone's lot in life may go up. Guys like you, Tyler, you know, would not like that necessarily and that wouldn't be for you so maybe you stay in business and do your thing but you know you might end up being the minority as opposed to the majority yeah absolutely how does manufacturing grow its productivity 1500 percent right um from you know world war the end of world war ii to now and construction is flat you know, they do it by consolidating, by growing, by embracing, by competing, by getting that technology in there um, and by improving productivity relentlessly over and over and over. And not everybody may like that future or like to hear it. But I will tell you, that's one of the ways that they do it. And a union guy on a GM floor is not busting his ass in the trenches on a job site. And they've got full benefits and you know decent pay. And I don't want to get into that debate, but you get my point. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at all of these small companies, everyone 
starts at zero and completely like starts from scratch. It's like, all right, I need a bookkeeper. All right. What's I'm... the process for bookkeeping? What's the process for estimating? What's the, and it's, you know, I think of a layer, we had them on, you know, and they're this like, I, I'm going to, pro- I don't think they're necessarily a franchise. You buy into their franchise at some, in some sense, but essentially they're, they're, they're finding like the, who's the, who's who in each market and says, Hey, we want to acquire you. We'll give you all of the back end support. You keep doing your thing but we're just going to give you all the office admin and lead support and you, and, and you focus on building really great product. That's super smart. The yeah. business, the business model makes sense. Now I have, now I can be the crass person I want. Yeah. I, I can have as many people as I want do as many projects as I want, but I'm backed by a bigger corporation that is making sure that my taxes are done right. That my accounting is done right. That I have a, a an appropriate lead sales funnel, you know, bringing quality leads to, to, to my e- inbox. Most of mo- these small guys don't have that. It's I mean, the complete ebb and flow. The, the carpenter, I'm sorry to interrupt Tyler, but the, just the carpenter who's on the floor making that wall for Ted Benson, um, that is passive house standard. Okay. Mm-hmm. That carpenter is not going out and finding jobs and he is not billing the customer and he is not having to manage, you know, his, advertising spending on Facebook or HR. He is getting to be a carpenter eight hours a day to make the most advanced wall in the marketplace. That is by default, passive house or better when customers don't even ask for it. I mean, what is a higher celebration of his trade and a higher show of respect for him as a craftsperson than creating that environment where he can do that and only that and not have to put up with all the other stuff that he would consider bullshit, like finding the client, chasing the money, doing the marketing, the HR, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you want to talk about old world you know, connection, I'll never forget the scene from a movie, Cold Mountain. It was a great book. I watched The Mountain. I think Jude Law's in it, but they're building a house. There's a guy who's a sawyer. He like pushes the handsaw back and forth and there's a guy on the ground who sharpens the sawyer's saw (laughs) like that was the job you saw he sharpens that guy hammers and it sounds you know antiquated but that's like the high art form right if you just get to specialize and do your one thing you become an amazing craftsperson or joiner if you get to do that and if you're running around with your head cut off all day long you'll never get there but that guy on benson's you know factory floor is the high art of carpentry that can make the most advanced wall in the marketplace. Sorry. I mean, mean, even if you think about the manufacturing process and what those companies look like, essentially our small residential companies are all manufacturing houses. And it's like, Nick, if you had to manufacture parts for a car, it would take you so long because you don't have the resources, the systems, the processes, there's, there's a handful of manufacturing companies that make those parts for everyone. And it's like we have however many hundreds of thousands of small residential companies manufacturing homes a different way without any sort of backing, without any sort of systems, without any sort of processes. And it is going to stun our growth and it is very difficult. Um, but it everyone right now is in it for themselves and they're looking to sustain and survive and uh it it really is going to have to take something dramatic i feel for things to change in that sense big picture Uh, tyler you just said systems it reminds me of uh, that cape cod panel conversation that i I listened to when they told that statistic about you know 50 percent reduction in man hours 60 percent increase in revenue one of you guys asked how and why and the answer was oh it's just systems Right. His answer was, it's because we created the systems, which also reminded me of a Ted Benson quote that he told me many, many years ago. You know, he said, construction isn't a system, you know, home residential construction isn't a system. It's a bad habit. It, people have just been doing it by yeah. habit, just, just been following the guy that they saw on their, their, their job site. And then they went on their own and all the habits they learned from the guy that they work with for six summers or six years, they went and did it themselves. The systems aren't in place. To your point, Tyler, you guys are now just assembling manufactured materials and they are the ones who are innovating for you. 
they are dropping three processes into one right because you have fewer and fewer people who do it or less and less skilled people to do it they're prefabricating the trim um the the, the sheathing the christ i still remember when they first came out with the square strainer drain you know how they, they were for a thousand years they were round and then they came out with a square one i was like why square and like i I, I know there's many reasons, but they were like, because it's hard to nibble the tile into yeah. a circle. And they were just like, put a goddamn square one in there and everything will just go up right to it. I was like, oh my God. And that's because there are just fewer guys willing to nibble well. Right. So they're the ones who are innovating and the spoils go to them. So what uh, what's this old house going to do to make the changes? It's all on you I guys. Just- I do just have to step back and say that I'm embarrassed that I admitted to watching Cold Mountain and complain about a warm um, raw bar. At least it wasn't Brokeback Mountain. (laughs) If those two clips come out of this thing, people are going to be like, who is this guy? He just said he read and watched Cold Mountain with Jude. Whatever. (laughs) No shade on Jude Law. It was a good book. But I just remember that scene, you know, the old fashioned, the, the skilled, specialized trade. Uh, I don't know the answer to your question, Tyler, about what we're going to do. You know, we've got Generation Next. It's a it's a marketing campaign. It helps. Um, it's not going to move the needle. Yeah, you know? it's a it's a multi billion dollar industry. It, you know, as I said, six hundred thousand construction small construction firms driven by a handful of just mega companies. You know, these are big macroeconomic things. We're not going to move the needle. We're doing what we can do, but that's not where it happens. Yeah, and I think that a lot of us get by thinking that everyone can do what they do and a change will take place organically. It'll bring us to where it needs to. Um, So maybe we'll just dig our heels in and ride that one out. The industry has changed significantly, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years due to the labor shortage um, and will continue to do so. Like we don't notice it because we've got our noses down. But if you step back, these innovations, you know, these sum into one ideas, there's no stopping them. There's yeah. absolutely no stopping them. And, and it will probably get to the point, Tyler, where you say you're really not building a house, Nick, you're manufacturing it. Yeah. You, you'll probably just one day find that there's no alternative than a panelized wall because it just it makes absolutely no sense at all because they will come out with one that's better and cheaper. Um, yeah. it's, it's a very slow process, but better Cheaper, more for less is what drives all of the technological innovation. I mean, it's like Windows. When we went to visit Anderson, it's like Windows used to come broken down. And now yeah. you couldn't get a window to come broken down now. So I think over the next, I think even even as short as five years, we're going to see insane changes in, in terms of technology. And, you know, uh, a good friend of mine spends a lot of his time uh, researching and investing in construction technology specifically. And he's always sending me stuff. And he sent me one recently. He actually sent me two. I, I want to mention one was you could basically go into this website and build a house, like just, you know, manipulate like, oh, I want to put a front porch. And it's like, and it drops, it drops it visually like, oh, no, I want to change the roof. And you, you could basically build this custom house. You could drag it like you would do on SketchUp, extrude walls, whatever you wanted. And when you were done, you could hit save, print, and it would give you an, a complete construction drawing set ready for permit. Like wall details, structural drawings. Sounds drawing. dangerous. It does, but this is where it's headed. And a, a similar one, uh, which was um, it was a property analyzer where it's like it you could type in an address. It was over uh, in a different country currently. And you could type in an address and it would pull up the lot information. And then it would use AI to pull all the data on that and say, hey, this is this is the topography of the, the lot based on the local zoning ordinance. This is what you could build. If you wanted to build a commercial project, this is your limitations. You want to build multifamily, you could do that. It would basically spit out a pro forma of what that lot could be. So a property a developer and investor can can know immediately Rather than, you know, people we're spend you, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars getting this information easily. You, you say, oh, OK, this lot makes sense. Oh, no. Hey, I didn't realize that the entire lots in wetlands and wetlands and this municipality will never let anything fly. Let's pass on it. And and we're in and we go back to this speed conversation. It's like we are we are reducing the 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 the, the mind numbing work out of it. Where it's like, let's just get to the fun part, man. 
Let's get to the fun part. You know, I don't want to sit here and try to figure out if I can build something. I want to build something. And if something can tell me I can do it faster, great. If the majority of the the population doesn't want to build an elaborate custom home, and most of them, but but most of them would love the customized option, and they can go on a computer and manipulate and spit out a drawing set that can be permitted that day, why wouldn't we embrace that? Someone, someone will, and they'll win. You know, they'll grow faster and they'll pay their people more and they'll slowly eat away. You guys know Chris E. Um, yeah. I with him a couple of times. He and I were talking about this and I asked him because he's really good at research. I was like, how much does a house weigh? He's like, what? I was like, just find out how much a house weighs. So he found <laughs> this article, the guy up in the Pacific Northwest weighed a house. He did the calculations. Long story short, um, you know, 2,500 square feet weighs somewhere between 300 and 600,000 pounds. If you take all the components and you put it together. I watch our places be built. Now, most of them are renovations, but I watch it. I watch all that material come onto the job site and be dropped off. And then I watch people pick it up and move it, you know, a couple times. 600,000 pounds. 300, 600,000 pounds. That's what you're asking your guys to do. Hmm. Let's get to the fun part. Like, why do you want them to move all those two by fours to lay it down on a deck so they can frame that wall and lift the thing up versus having that thing flown in? Mm -hmm. You know, or put the forms up and take them down and pour that concrete foundation on site when superior walls can fly it in for you with a crane insulation in ready for board. I mean, somebody's got to move the 600 pounds of shit to get Mm -hmm. that house built. And then we scratch our heads why nobody wants to go in to the trades. That list I told you about what people want and out of their jobs, they have a list of what they don't want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) First thing on the list is hard physical labor. That's the first thing on the list. So and, I, and listen, I don't care who where we're going to bring, let's call it 400,000 pounds of stuff and tell them, I want you to move it from the piles right. there and put it up, you know, 20 feet high into a house. And, and, and Ke- Kevin, there's going to be like an enormous amount of people that are going to react to what you just said. No, I like hard physical work. Like, screw you. Like, I like waking up and busting my ass. Listen. Every one of you that like everyone that's going to react that way. Yeah, there there's the the grit behind it, like that you like waking up and working with your hands and busting your ass, but you don't want to do it every day. I don't care who you are. There's days where you like going out and getting your ass kicked and like, you know, just putting in hard physical labor in. But there's days where you don't want to be doing that and moving a pile of two by fours 20 feet because the, the lull can't make it around the house. That's shit work. And I don't care. Like, no one's going to be like, I love doing this. Sign me. Si- yeah, sign me up. Johnny would have loved it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He'd be arguing with me right now about how that makes you a better person or whatever. I mean, I know he wouldn't be. But, yeah, so, some people. Yeah, you, you, you're right, Nick. There'll be criticism. But I'm talking about it at macro levels. 100%. Structural structural hurdles to this industry to, you know, to get done what they got to get done. And it needs a new mindset. I, I just... I've seen job sites. I've watched, I've just driven by and I've watched guys carrying bundles up a ladder. And, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. The ladder Vader, like I just, run the thing dude, up the ladder. I just I mean, saw a video on Instagram. I'm going to have to send it to you guys where they set a pulley up and the dude was climbing up the ladder, hooking a bundle of shingles to him and then jumping down and having the shingles fly up when he jumped down. <laughs> Don't they play the Mario song over it or something like that? Know. I think I was watching it in bed, so my yeah. phone was on oh, silent, but on I you. sent it to a couple of people. That's, Dude, the way I, to, that's the way to do it. We were on, I was on my yeah. job yesterday, and Wood Floor Company shows up, and one guy gets out of the truck, and he's like, hey, where do you guys want the flooring? And my super's like, hey, we're going to put half of it here and half upstairs. And they're like, all right. And so I'm in a meeting, and we're doing our thing. And I hear a bunch of bracket going on and I walk, I walk to the end of the house and this guy, one bundle at a time, bringing in the house up the stairs, stacking it. And I overhear him talking to my super. He's like, dude, I have my shoulder, my shoulder's numb. I haven't heard, I haven't felt my shoulder in two years. And he's, he's like happy as a clam. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, there, there has to be a better way. Like, why, be. why is it? Why are we? delivering wood flooring in bundles that are then carried one bundle at a time by a single human being through a house. And, and they'll be touched again. They're going to be touched two or three times. Yeah. Th- there's no way they're in the right spot. 
It's like yeah. that just it never happens. It's like, oh yeah. shit, we actually want to start here, so can we move them everywhere else? Three hundred pounds. Three hundred thousand pounds. Yeah. Moved by a guy with a numb shoulder. Why doesn't anybody go into the trains? <laughs> It's Kevin, true. I think we can wrap this up with, like, I love your saying sum into one. And, you know, that's my takeaway from this is thinking about, you know, like, how do we create sum into one? How do we take, you know, some things and, and, and consolidate it into one? And anyone that's listening, I think, can take that and implement that immediately, you know, whether it is, you know, physical work or a process within their business. but um. We've made tremendous progress in four and a half years since we've talked. Uh, and hopefully our next conversation will not be four and a half years, but it will be interesting to see what the, the industry looks like for another four and a half years from now. I don't think we should talk for four and a half years just to let it marinate and see what happens. We could try. Because <laughs> if we talk in six months, we'll be just be ranting about the same thing. So let's... Touche. <laughs> June, what is it? It's May. May 16th. 2029 new year no no 20 i don't even know four and a half years 2027 it'll be the new year 2024 no 2028 will be four and a half january january 1st 2028 you guys could call me up in four and a half years and i'll be at a cocktail party drinking yeah fancy (laughs) liquor cold oysters yeah reading reading cold mountain or whatever other crazy book that guy wrote and by then we should be able to teleport to you and just do this live yeah Last time we did it live. You guys ambushed me, by the way. I had no idea we were going to do the podcast that night, and I had too many beers in me. That's why we started arguing. We there was that, no ambushing was no... going on. I, I don't know why, but I didn't think we were doing the podcast that night. We had dinner and everything you like thought that. You were you thought we were having dinner and just going to talk about having a podcast? I thought it was just to meet you guys. Or Wait, hang oh, out. so your wife isn't baking anymore, or was it your kid who was baking? Didn't you say no, that you guys had wife. like a baking yeah, yeah so, baking business. She's, no, she's his kids her. were her, his kids were phenomenal. They they they, they like served us. Yeah, but he like, said waiters. that his wife was a, your wife has a, a corporate she, job she, now. Yeah, well, she she sold her half of that business to the woman who founded it, the the the, the baker in the equation, um, and she's director of marketing at an architectural firm. Hmm. Um, but more importantly, it was an ambush. I would never have gone however many beers deep I went, <laughs> which led to that argument. Because I don't know why. I was just like, we're not going to do it now, are we? Uh, I feel like you only had like two, maybe well, th- have- maybe three tops. Maybe it was all the desserts. I don't remember dessert. Was it desserts? I remember. Yeah, you, the, your daughter made good. dessert. Oh, yeah. Wasn't Ryan from Cucan there? Yeah. 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 I just put mm. the blazer back in the garage. Now I'm thinking about dessert, but I don't know anyone who owns a dessert company anymore. So there goes that idea. Sorry. Didn't, <laughs> didn't you build a dessert place up here by us, Nick? Doesn't your friend run? Um... Oh, Honeycomb. Yeah. Doesn't your friend run Honeycomb? Yeah. We, oh, I forgot we did the, uh, we built the bar in there. I think we, or built some cabinetry. I forget what we did up there. We built something there. Someone, someone um... you know. Yeah, Honeycomb, uh, a good friend of my wife's growing up. So cool. Well, we appreciate your time, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin. Twenty twenty seven, boys. I'll see you in twenty twenty seven. Thank you. Always a joy. party. <laughs> Always a pleasure. <laughs> see you, man. See you guys. Thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs>